Okay. All right, it is a little past 10.15, so we're going to get started. All right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last day of the 241st meeting of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, my name is Ben Cassess. I'm the AAS Media Fellow. Uh, today, I'm helping out Carrie Hensley, the Deputy Press Officer, and we're, uh, we're grateful for Amy Oliver's help with running around the microphone during our Q&A session. So today's session this morning is uh, titled Clouds and Nebulae. We have five presenters, two of whom will be virtual. So just to lay out the ground rules, as it has been uh, with all the other conferences, each of our presenters will speak in order, but we'll hold all of our Q&A to the end. Uh, I ask that you silence any devices that you have that could make noise over the course of the press conference. Um, and yes, so I'll start by giving a brief uh, introduction of each of our speakers, and then we'll jump right into it. So our first speaker will be Dr. Garrett Verschur, who will be talking about a new distance estimate to the high velocity cloud complex. After him will be Joan Schmelz of a supernova origin of a high velocity cloud complex. After her will be Dr. Rob Fiesen of an exceptional remnant nebula nebulosity of the late 12th century galactic supernova. Following him will be Dr. Bruce Ballack of a temptuous life of a butterfly nebula, NGC 6302. And finally, Dr. Peter Barnes will speak about Sophia and Alma investigations, the case of a masquerading monster in BF BYF 73. So I'm excited for all of our speakers. Uh, Carrie instructed me to say a little fun backstory. I'm particularly excited for Dr. Fiesen's presentation. By sheer coincidence in the small world of our community, I was in the telescope control room when he made these observations that he'd be telling you about. So I had no idea what he was looking at at the time, but he was very excited. So I'm excited to see the conclusion of this story. So with that, we'll begin with our first presenter, Dr. Garrett Verscher. And if you could share your slides, that'd be great. Okay, let's see, you better start the slideshow. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Garrett for sure. This year marks the 60th anniversary of the discovery of the mysterious high velocity clouds, concentrations of interstellar neutral hydrogen located in an area sky well to the north of the Milky Way. They're characterized by anomalous velocities inconsistent with the regular rotation of the Milky Way galaxy. This is a map of high velocity cloud M, complex M, a long twisted filamentary feature at a velocity of minus 85 kilometers per second. But why is complex M up there? Where did it come from? Why does it have such a high velocity? What is its distance? Distance is the clue to understanding high velocity clouds. Without a distance estimate, we can't begin to understand why these clouds even exist. Here is a map of high velocity cloud M1 at a velocity of minus 120 kilometers per second using data from the Effelsberg Bonn survey. M1 is isolated in velocity and position and is clearly more than a simple cloud. But here is a question for you. What's the one thing that no one looks at when trying to understand the nature of a high velocity cloud? The answer, the low velocity gas. Why? Because high velocity clouds are believed to be in the galactic halo as much as a thousand parsecs from the sun. And the low velocity gas is in the solar neighborhood within a few hundred parsecs of the sun. Now, as part of my research over the years, I created hundreds of hydrogen maps and I printed them out and stored them in three ring binders. During the COVID lockdown, Joan began paging through these binders. And here is one of the maps she looked at, at minus 14 kilometers per second. There's a lot of structure in these maps and Joan's eyes kept dragging her back to this structure, which is a cavity. Now in alone, in the light of Joan's discovery, I used the Simbad website to search for any interesting objects in the direction of M1. And what I found, was the star Ursa Majoris. This is the center of the cavity, apparent magnitude five, which means that it's visible to the naked eye on a good night. And it is spectral type G, it's a yellow giant at a distance of 163 parsecs. But it's a peculiar star, a peculiar binary because it is a single lined spectroscopic binary. And what does that mean? That means it has an invisible companion the companion may be a neutron star. And if it is a neutron star, that will be left over after a supernova explosion. 
which would have cleared out the cavity. So M1 is then at the near side of this expanding shell. Now our data have allowed us to calculate that the explosion occurred about 100,000 years ago, and that the distance to M1 on the near side of the shell is 150 parsecs. This is the first ever estimate of distance for any high velocity cloud in 60 years. It turns out that the invisible companion of 56 Ursa Major may really be a neutron star, as scores as L show in a paper that has just been accepted for publication in astronomy and astrophysics. But what does M1 at minus 120 kilometers per second have to do with complex M at minus 85 kilometers per second? Let's look at a series of hydrogen maps that have to that begin with complex uh, with the high velocity cloud M1 on the left hand side, and the velocity is shown at the top. And as we scan through a series of these maps, you will see that high velocity cloud M1 has simply morphed into this rather long filamentary feature, rather complex. I'm going to go back now, show it again quickly. To be begin with M1, but M1 clearly is just part of what we now, the combination of those two is what we call complex M. So there's no clear boundary between M1 and the twisted filament. And together we call that complex M. They morph into each other. It means that complex M as a whole is at the same distance as M1. But what is the origin story of complex M? Now that we know the distance, our next step is to investigate that origin and Joan is gonna tell us how to do that, what we, what we learned. Thank you. John there? Ah. I can't hear you, John. Just finding the mute button. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Garrett, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Joan Schmelz from USRA. This new research that Garrett and I have been working on suggests that high velocity cloud complex M may be the result of a supernova that blew up over 4 million years ago. Oops. So radio data from the 100 meter telescope in Germany show a cavity of interstellar neutral hydrogen gas. The best view of this cavity is at a velocity of 25, minus 25 kilometers per second which shows a circular cross section on the back receding face of the cavity. Here's complex M like Garrett just showed you with a velocity of minus 85. It's on the front approaching face of the cavity. And as we just found out, its distance is 150 parsecs. If a supernova created this cavity, we might expect to see a high energy signature. And the gamma rays don't disappoint. Here's the gamma ray data from NASA's Imaging Compton Telescope in color with the contours from the radio image overplotted. At attempts to explain the origin and energy of high velocity clouds go back to the early days of radio astronomy in the 1960s. Promising, promising models included things like condensations in the hot galactic halo, parts of the outer spiral structure, return flows in a galactic fountain, infall to the galaxy, and fallout from the Perseus Spurshell. With the notable exception of the Magellanic Stream, which was torn out of the Magellanic Clouds in a tidal interaction with the Milky Way, the debate over the origin stories for high velocity clouds continues. Although supernova were considered as the energy source back in the 60s, they were rejected based on the evidence available at the time from optical absorption studies 
that placed high velocity clouds thousands of parsecs away in the galactic halo and beyond. If the distances are this large, the masses are high, and the energy needed to accelerate all that mass requires many supernova. So for decades, the energy considerations made the supernova explanation unlikely. But if high velocity clouds are much closer, like Garrett just told us, supernova become a viable energy mechanism. We can use our observations and some simple trigonometry to get results. So the radio and gamma ray data show a cavity centered uh, at galactic coordinates 150 degrees, 50 degrees. Knowing the distance to complex M and assuming the cavity is spherical, we can bootstrap the distance to the supernova at the center of the cavity, 307 parsecs. We can calculate the radius of the cavity, 166 parsecs. Assuming that complex M is on the front face of an expanding spherical shell, we can calculate the expansion velocity, 40 kilometers per second. The expansion velocity and the extent of the shell on the sky tell us that the origi original explosion event, the supernova, took place about 4 million years ago. The total energy needed to move all that gas is, is about 50, uh, three times 10 to the 50 ergs, well within the energy budget of a typical supernova. As the blast wave from the supernova propagates outward, it sweeps up the interstellar gas and carves out a feature, a well-known feature called the local chimney. It's a low density extension of the local bubble that reaches all the way into the galactic halo. Let me spend the last minute making the connection to the big picture. We've started to unravel a 60 year old astronomical mystery. The reason it's been a mystery for so long is that things we thought we knew turned out to be false. Not for any nefarious reasons, but because we learn more with new data. We all expect great, great discoveries from JWST and we won't be disappointed. But we don't necessarily expect new discoveries from archive data, but those discoveries are in there too. With the old high velocity cloud models, targeted observations of small patches of sky could suffice. But all sky surveys like the one we used here give us the chance to connect cavities and clouds at vastly different velocities and follow filaments as they arc across the sky. We find that interstellar matter is much more complex and connected than we originally thought. But with new dist distance estimates for high velocity clouds, we can start looking in earnest for the evidence of supernovae. And these all sky surveys give us the perfect way to search. These results make complex M um, the first high velocity cloud complex with both a well-determined distance and a clear-cut origin story. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm also going to talk about supernova. Uh, where did the... Sorry, that was my fault. I shared the wrong desktop. Apologies, everyone.
No. <laughs> Might have been worse than I thought. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to talk about an exceptional supernova remnant called P830, which is the remains of a late 12th century historic supernova. My collaborators are Brad Schaefer and Dana Patrick. Dana is an amateur astronomer, and in 2013, he was looking for planetary nebula. A lot of amateurs find planetary nebula, and he was noticing an infrared emission nebula that was sort of donut shaped. You can see it in the 22 micron image by WISE, which is NASA's Wide Field Infrared Server Explorer, also seen also in the 12 micron image. And he named it like amateurs do uh, after himself, his first two letters of his last name. And it was his 30th discovery. So it's called PA30. Um, he notified some planetary researchers, planetary nebula researchers at Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona and they took an image of it. And this is uh, an image in the lower part of the frame that's taken with the 2.1 meter Kitt Peak Telescope. You could barely see there was something there. Uh, that was surprising, that was a 20 minute exposure. So that was odd. Well, this was followed up by more observations, but a few misses. A year later, Kitt Peak researchers on planetary maybe took a spectrum of that faint nebulosity with a three and a half meter telescope. And they didn't see the usual components of emission lines as you see in planetary nebula. They didn't see any hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Where is everything? They never reduced their data. There was really nothing to reduce. Two years later, a group of University of Hong Kong astronomers who work very closely with amateurs studying planetary nebula and trying to find new ones in the galaxy, they used a 10 meter telescope mounted on in the Canary Islands. They didn't see anything either. They didn't reduce their data either. Two years later, <laughs> some French astronomers who also work on planetary nebula noticed there was a blue star in the center of PA30. And central stars of planetary nebula are very hot and blue. And they said, let's take a spectrum of it. They used an eight inch telescope. And they found a very odd looking spectrum, unlike any central star of any planetary nebula, a very broad, emission line near the very ultraviolet edge of the spectrum. They transmitted that information to the Hong Kong astronomers who were amazed. And they went back and looked at their data from the Grand Canary Telescope, the 10 meter and the three and a half meter at Kitt Peak. And they began to publish, prepare a publication. This backstory uh, is, is important to understand what you're gonna see later. So it took a year um, the, at the same time, the same year, the 2018, Russians noticed the same wise 22 micron, 12 micron image that showed a donut shape. That, and they found a blue star in the center, just like the French had noticed. And they concluded it was a massive white dwarf star. Um, you can't really see it from the back of the room, but these images show a little white circle. That is the blue star in the center of this infrared shell. The bottom panel shows you the ultraviolet spectrum they took with a six meter telescope, whereas the French already needed an eight inch telescope. That star, that faint little star in the center has an astounding wind, 16,000 kilometers per second. That's 35 million miles an hour, 210,000 degrees Kelvin, many times, almost uh, 36,000 times brighter than the sun's luminosity. And they thought, they came to the conclusion that it's actually a merger of two white dwarfs, a carbon oxygen rich white dwarf and a carbon, I'm sorry, an oxygen neon white dwarf. Merger cause can cause, it takes uh, several million years for that collision, that merger to take place. But during the process of the merger, you can get a very odd supernova called a 1AX. 1AXs are subluminous supernova that have no hydrogen or helium. You know. And we've only known about 1AXs for the last, in the last 20 years. The Hong Kong astronomers finally published their paper in 2021, 
but they added some very important elements to it. There at the top on the left, you can see their images. The optical image is terrible. It's just blue. You can't hardly tell what's going on. But they noticed that the, looking back at the Grand Canary teles telescope data, it emitted in sulfur. Huh. Okay. So they noticed, they measured that, and that's found it, it was expanding at 1,100 kilometers per second. That's young. It is PA30 is a young object. And they also noticed that PA30 is next to where the Chinese and Japanese observed the star in 1181 AD. So it's young, and they connected it to the 1181. Now, their estimate of the age was about 1,000 years plus or minus 300. Well, I and my colleagues decided this thing shows up in sulfur. Let's do a reconnaissance of it in sulfur 2, sulfur emission. So we took a sulfur 2 image, and this is what we see. I have worked on supernova remnants for 30 years. I've never seen anything like this. There are no remnants in our galaxy that look like this. There's hundreds of very fine filaments and the nature of which is not totally certain. You can get fine filaments either by contrails on object moving very fast through a slow medium, a blading material off as they move through, through that medium, or you can get it as a windsock. Now this, there's a faint, there's a bright star that has nothing to do with it off to the right center, but there's a fainter star just left of it that is the astounding star of 16,000 clouds per second. We don't see winds of stars with 16,000 clouds per second. That just is unheard of. And, but that is the reason why this thing looks, we think, the way it does. This is the astronomically published version of it. But the point is that it's the same size as the infrared shells. In the top right corner, you see the wise 22 micron. It's a donut shape. And we think it's a donut shape because it's clear in the center. This is a thick shell object. And it's been pushed, it snow plowed. The ejecta that occurred in 1181 pushed the material away because of the astounding wind. Now the star doesn't have that wind all the time. And right after the explosion for the first two decades, according to the models, this thing is gonna have a crazy wind. So we think that's what produced this donut shape. So the bottom line is we have a very unusual object this amateur discovered object is, has many dozens of long thin filaments converging near the hot star that the French and Russians identified a few years ago. Our spectra confirmed that the expansion is 1100. That's right. And, but we get a much more precise age. They had a thousand years plus or minus 300. We have 850 plus or minus 60. Not very good, almost too good. Uh, we conclude that its appearance is due to the extremely high winds of that center star. That's the reason why it looks so odd. It's beautifully symmetric. So there's beauty, science, and history in the story. It's a beautiful structure. It's unique. We never have seen anything like this. This is just the colorized version. It's scientifically important because we don't understand 1A axis, mergers of two white dwarfs that leave a compact surviving star in the center. So we have this nearby 1A axis. We've never seen a 1A axis in our galaxy. So here we have one that's just a few thousand light years away. And it's the remains of, finally, we have really nailed down the remains of the star that the Chinese and Japanese saw in the early August of 1181 AD. It's also a good connection between public outreach amateurs and professionals working together. Thank you. Would you start me up? Given what just happened at the start of his talk, I'm going to get some expert help. <laughs> I'm the one who messed it up last time, so I'm sure you want that. Okay. So my, I, I'm Bruce Ballack, and I, I will introduce myself. I'm from here in Seattle, the University of Washington. I'm giving a talk today about work um, based on Hubble images that you'll see during the course of the talk in a project that was headed up by Joel Kastner, who's sitting right over there, raise your hand. <laughs> he is actually the leader of our group. And it's been a pleasure, a real pleasure to work with Joel, more so than, well, it, okay. Let's, let's, let's go forward. The butterfly nebula is what you see here in front of us. It doesn't look much like a butterfly. And in fact, the point of this talk 
is to show you that it's really a psychopathic dragon sneezing fire out into the world around it. So butterfly is a disguise. Um, and, and what we've learned from this is what you learn from studying psychopathic behavior, which sometimes brings to the fore behavior patterns which you normally don't see, and that's certainly gonna be the case here. Now, let me just start by saying stellar evolution for the most part is very well understood. Stars like the one at the center of the butterfly, which we can't see by the way, it's hidden behind too much dust. Uh, so when I say we know about the star, actually we don't know it from direct observations, we infer stellar properties from the nebula outside of it. In any event, stars evolved down well-trod paths uh, and we understand a lot about stars, except maybe at the very beginning and at the very end. Uh, and certainly the butterfly is an example of a star ending its life in a way that was never expected and, and nor predicted. Now, most planetary nebulae of which the butterfly has traditionally been, uh, it's been classified as a planetary most of them are, make, make the most elegant, beautiful pictures, right? The early years of Hubber, Hubble featured a lot of planetaries and press releases, and they're just strikingly beautiful and symmetric. But you can infer that they were for, that formed in a process that was gentle, not an explosion, right? Things were very well controlled by something, and, and we're still learning how that works. But that's not the point of this talk. Um, let me come back to that later. Oops. No. Okay. Goals. The point of studying planetaries is not so much to understand the pretty pictures. If you're an astronomer, the goal is to understand stellar evolution and the processes by which planetary nebulae are formed. So that has to, that's a foundation on which this, this talk is built. Um, I'm going to come back to that. So here are pictures of the butterfly nebula. The one at the bottom is made from images that Joel and our team took using Hubble. The upper one is a wide field shot taken from the ground much earlier. This thing doesn't resemble the planetaries that we were looking at earlier. For one thing, it's much bigger. The total length of the planet planetary from core to the extreme outside is a parsec or about three light years. Planetaries are never that big. They're usually one-tenth that size. The bottom picture shows an overlay of the Hubble images. Uh, the Hubble field of view is shown in the yellow box in the upper image. And what we were completely surprised to find and what motivated a lot of the thinking that goes under this talk are those purple wings, which come from a lion of iron, which is excited only by fast winds in shocks. You see iron too, this line, in supernova remnants and herbig hair objects. You rarely see it in planetary nebulae. So that right away was telling us something weird has happened. Moreover, the gas was not emitted along the east-west symmetry axis. It's coming off at some queer angle. And that too is telling us to expect the unexpected. What we did at the University of Washington, I was working with an undergraduate student, um, Lars Bokhart, who's now a graduate student in Denmark. We compared two images, two Hubble images, outstandingly high quality images taken through the same filter separated by 11 years. Essentially, we wanted to look for patterns of change. One way to do that is just subtract one image from the other. That's not quite what you're looking at here. You're looking at the ratio of two images separated uh, by 11 years. You see something that looks like a splash. The white is showing where the nebular pieces were in the later image. The black is showing you where they were in the earlier image. So as you go from black to white, you're looking at objects that are moving outward. And, and the, the pattern here is clearly chaotic. 
Lars uh, figured out, uh, this, I, this, I couldn't believe he could do this. He found six regions um, in the upper frame which have different ages. So these are splashes emitted uh, by the star over the course of, of 1300, 1400 years, starting 2300 years ago and ending 900 years ago. Pam, bop, pow. And, and these outflows as shown here by the arrows come in pairs and they're in different directions. That is, so the, the, the fact that the outbursts are intermittent and they're not aligned with one another is the real challenge of understanding um, how this thing formed. And it, we're really talking about the behavior pattern of the star we can't see. So the models, we go through a list of standard explanations that might explain what we're looking at. Uh, the, the upper image here is, is a cartoon of Betelgeuse, which expelled the dust cloud. And, and maybe that process is going on in the star that we can't see to form the flows in the butterfly. That doesn't work. Um, these ejections from Betelgeuse are barely at, at 20 kilometers per second. 10 miles per hour in round numbers. And what we see in the butterfly, the speeds go up to 600 kilometers a second. So 450 miles per second. So the, the, the speed rules this out. Um, another common model is to talk about mass exchange in a close binary system where the evolving, uh, an evolving star here, whoops, ejects flows of material that it grabs from a, a donor star a loose, with loosely bound outer layers. That material flows into what's called an accretion disk. Magnetic fields at the very center of this disk propel jets outward. Now, this model fails because um, you don't get different directions. The, 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 these two stars together are like a gyroscope. They don't wobble. The jets would keep coming out in the same direction. So the bottom image is like the one just above it in which we fantasize that there's a third star in a close orbit that comes by from time to time and wobbles the disk and sends the, uh, that, the close passage of that star um, adds to the mass flow rate from the companion and it wobbles the disk to, to to um, send the outbursts off in different directions. <laughs> that's, as, <laughs> that's as far in our understanding as, as we've gotten here. Like Robert, um, the details really matter and we are desperately trying to uh, figure out ways to incorporate them in a sensible explanation. And the usual statement applies, we need more observations. I think that's the end of it. Yeah, so these figures are available from the press office if you'd like them. Okay, I'm going to end this, I hope. I need help. I advise you to get help. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm good. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So I'd like to follow up uh, the previous few talks by telling you about another mystery that which we've been trying to uh, figure out involving how stars actually form, which has also got a lot of puzzles to it. So there's a list of my collaborators. And so what I want to tell you about is something I've called the masquerading monster in a cloud BYF73, which Sophia and Alma help us uh, to figure out a little bit of the puzzle of how massive stars form. So uh, it's a cloud, cloud 73 from this catalog. Uh, is about two and a half kiloparsecs away or 8,000 light years. It's a somewhat massive cloud, uh, but that by itself is not particularly special. Um, 
the interesting thing and the image there shows that there is a nebula associated with the cloud, but by far most of the energy uh, coming out at long wavelengths uh, is on the left there, centered around a much more heavily obscured and colder uh, collection of gas. And the mystery initially was that we detected an inflow of material towards that central red area, which was the highest rate of mass inflow in a protostellar object uh, that we've ever seen, about a, a sun's mass worth of material flowing inwards every 30 years. So that's a lot of material. And so we took some Sophia and Gemini data a few years ago and figured out uh, that from the broad spectral distribution of, of the energy that the mass of the central object, which we called MIR2, was around 240 times the mass of the sun. So that, again, is a very large number for a protostar and will prob almost certainly form a very massive star. So the puzzle was, um, how does this mass inflow actually make such a massive protostar? And what are the details? And so we wanted to get more data. So we went back to Sophia and we also went to ALMA to get information, including the magnetic field information, which is important in star formation. It must play some role, but the interesting part is exactly what. And we look at magnetic field information through polarized light at both facilities, both Sophia and ALMA can do polarized observations, and that tells us about the magnetic field. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly show you some of the pretty images. So the little uh, black lines there on the right panel show you the orientation of the magnetic field as we've inferred from the polarized far infrared light that Sophia maps. And then as, and you can see there that most of that is actually coming from the H2 region, so, or the, which is the nebula. Uh, which is sort of post star formation, if you like. So somewhat less interesting because we think we understand what's going on, but there is a small amount of polarized light coming from the central object. And the zoom in on the left shows that there is some additional structure beyond just the central object itself, which I've called the Eastern polarized lobe or EPL. So just, mm -hmm. it's just marked on there so you can keep track of what things are where. So that's the Sophia data. So that was helpful, but not particularly. So we went to ALMA, which was also helpful. Um, ALMA, of course, being at even longer wavelengths than Sophia, maps the coldest dust in these clouds, which is presumably the most intimately connected with the mass inflow that we saw and the protostars themselves. And what we do see with the ALMA data there in the top image is that most of the cold dust is uh, organized into a somewhat simple structure, which I've called the streamer, which is very massive, but it's not clear how it's related to the central protostar, that's that little white blob in the middle there, that's MIR2. And the only three other protostars that we can see in this image off to the left there, which are nowhere near as significant. So something very uh, unusually simple, but at the same time mysterious is going on. And then the bottom panel, we have the polarized Im uh, light image from ALMA, which again tells us what the magnetic field is doing in that cold gas. And you can see with, but with those little magenta colored lines that the orientation of the magnetic field is somewhat confused. So it's not entirely clear just from this what's going on. And here's an extra image here just to illustrate the nature of the problem. We've got the, the pretty nebula off to the right, but pretty but simple. The, uh, the material is being swept away there by the heating from young stars, which are already sort of on the main sequence, as we say. And then there's this central uh, obscured area, which is only emitting in the far infrared, where the magnetic field is oriented completely differently. And so something interesting must be going on there, but it's still not clear just from these data. Um, and this is another overlay zooming in showing the ALMA polarization data there. You can see the sort of um, brush stroke pattern superimposed on the red part of the image to show that the uh, magnetic field is aligned along that massive streamer but across MIR2 in a different direction. And so it's not entirely clear how the magnetic field is controlling or being pushed around by gravity or what indeed is going on. So it turns out that um, the key to the puzzle comes from ALMA spectroscopy, which is to say beyond just the dust emission, which we've been talking about so far, whether warm or cold, there are spectral lines from molecules, in particular carbon monoxide. Um, and 
carbon monoxide has the nice property that it very uh, nicely traces out protostellar outflows. So these are similar to outflows that Bruce and Robert have been mentioning in old stellar context, but in protostellar context, they indicate that material is accreting onto the central protostar MIR2. And there, are this, there is a red shifted lobe of the outflow, which is shown in this uh, picture with the red contours. So that's gas that's moving somewhat away from us. And there is a blue shifted lobe, which is gas moving towards us. And so when we do this, we have then discovered we don't immediately see the inflow, but instead, that is the inflow that is presumably that has been detected before going in towards MIR2, but we also see an outflow. It, it turns out the inflow is hidden in the out, outflow signature in a different spectral line, the 13 CO molecule, which I don't have a picture here because it gets a bit technical, but the uh, indication is that the flow of material inwards right around MIR2 is so fast that it can only be explained by a protostar, which is even more massive than what we previously calculated. So somewhere in the vicinity of 900 to 1300 times the sun's mass. And this is by far larger than what we thought. And so that's why I called this a masquerading monster. And what this means is that the estimate that we got before, which was based on the broad um, spectrum from the far infrared to the near infrared, has obviously missed a large fraction of the total mass, which is indicated by this gravitational infall. And uh, the only thought that we came up with to explain this was that a lot of the material around MIR2 is already in some sort of very massive disk where instead of just fine dust, there's perhaps rocks in orbit, which don't do a lot of emitting of anything because they're just cold rocks. And so there there's clearly is a lot of mass in there. And the uh, so, that's part of the puzzle solved. But as a bonus, we also discovered some other interesting things. So as I said, ALMA can do polarimetry or, and, and give us the magnetic field orientation, not just of the coal dust, but in the CO emission from the outflow. And so what I'm gonna show you here is a little movie going through the uh, spectral line channel. So the different Doppler shifts, if you like, starting with the blue side and moving through to the red side as well, and this is going to loop through. Um, so on top of the uh, outflow lobes, which you can see channel by channel in this movie, I've also superimposed the magnetic field information uh, or structure that we've obtained from the same outflow uh, CO data from ALMA, because we did this with uh, the polarization capability. And that shows us that the magnetic field uh, in this outflow is being presumably, it's aligned basically radially from the central object, which suggests that it's, uh, the magnetic field is being carried away from the center along with the gas in these outflow structures. But because uh, we can do a, a number of cute little statistical tricks and calculate es make, or estimate the strength of the magnetic field in these patterns, we can also compare the magnetic field energy density in the outflow to the kinetic energy density and see uh, which ones are more important where. And as you might expect, in the fastest outflowing parts of this bipolar structure, the kinetic energy is obviously very great, and it is presumably carrying away the material as well as the magnetic field energy. But close in to MIR2, where the outflow uh, speeds are just sort of getting started, it turns out the energy, magnetic energy density is quite a bit higher than the kinetic energy density. And this strongly suggests that the outflow itself is being driven by some sort of magnetocentrifugal effect right down where the material is flowing into MIR2 and spinning up in order to produce these nice polar outflow lobes. So uh, that's pretty much it. There's a lot of discoveries there that we weren't expecting. The uh, paper came out on archive. There's a webpage there with more supporting images like what I've been showing you. And I think uh, AAS is also retweeting so I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you for each of our presenters. Uh, so we'll do questions and a reminder if you're on Zoom to use the Q&A feature. 
um, go for chilling freelance from the Netherlands with three questions for Robert actually one uh, the first what telescope did you use to do the sulfur what telescope did you use to do the sulfur two observations second uh, what is the distance to the nebula and also suppose that the merger would happen now would we be able to see a strong gravitational wave signal and my third question is are you planning follow-up observations with a telescope like hubble or Webb? okay um Telescope was a 2.1 meter telescope at Kitt Peak. I did these observations back just a couple of months ago, late October. I wasn't planning to come to this meeting, but I saw something I had never seen before. Um, the distance to the object from Gaia measurements to the central star, which we believe is right at the remnant distance, is 2.4 kiloparsecs. Um, the 2.4 kiloparsecs. Uh, so um, the follow-up, so the optical image that was taken um, only, I think, gives a hint of what it really looks like. And we want to get Hubble images and JWST images. Hubble will see the sulfur-2 emission that I detected in great clarity. There was only one arc second uh, image quality of the night that I took the data. But um, the follow-up, uh, JWST, will be, should be amazing because it's nearly the Hubble resolution, but this thing is bright in the infrared. Uh, we like to see where the, uh, what the um, infrared signature looks like. And we think that the, as I said, the, it looks like these streaks may be um, wind socks of very tiny uh, ejecta knots that have been blown essentially apart by the really crazy wind of the central star. So we're hoping to see great detail. These things, it will be a very nice picture for JWC or Hubble, but it's scientifically very important because we don't understand 1AX's really at all. What about gravitational waves? Mm, not important for this object. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Christine Pulliam from Space Telescope Science Institute with a question and a comment for Robert. Uh, the question is if you have um, any idea what, what might be driving the super fast stellar wind. And the comment is that STSCI would very much love to publicize any Hubble or Webb observations you might get of this fascinating object. Thank you. Okay, um, what's driving the wind? That's a good question. Uh, stars simply don't have 16,000 kilometers per second wind. The highest velocity is typically wolf ray stars, a couple thousand kilometers, two or three, four thousand. 16,000 is insane. How do you do that? It's not by radiation. It's going to be by a magnetic field uh, that's spun up very fast. So you throw the stuff out. Now, we, that is only an expectation. It's a high speed rotation of the central star, but that's the one, that's the best current. Uh, scenario for producing wind. Uh, the models for 1AX is at least a couple show that the wind is going to be even out more outrageous in terms of luminosity, how much mass they're flowing out in the first one or two decades after the merger occurs. Okay, so, uh, and yes, this would make a great image uh, for um, just before 4th of July, if we can get. Uh, uh, there is, unfortunately, uh, I, I looked at it, um, Ben was observing with me and we could see structure. And we said, uh, this looks like an explosion, but it's really, we believe a, an explosion modified by a wind. Um, JWST or Hubble should make very clear what's really going on. And we want to know if the strikes of the uh, filaments point back to the star's location. In, uh, <laughs> I have a disagreement with my co-author. It's not clear that they point back to the star. Well, why not? Um, that goes into the understanding of how these 1AXs evolve. So it would be scientifically important for to get a high resolution image to see what the conversion point is, the focal point of all these filaments and how narrow they are and do they have little clumps, et cetera. Um, I've got a question. Uh, Carrie Hensley from the AAS. This one's for Peter. So you're finding that the mass of this protostar is likely upwards of a thousand solar masses. That sounds 
enormous to someone who doesn't study star formation. What is the expected final mass of such a protostar once it finishes moving on to the main sequence? Okay, so um, for people who have uh, studied a lot of protostars and tried to answer that question, um, mostly in the case of low mass star formation, so sun-like stars, the understanding currently is that uh, the, if the protostellar mass is some amount, then the final stellar mass will be something like 30% of that amount. So it's a factor of three less, and then the rest of the material is basically uh, gotten rid of at the end of the star formation process. So if that were the case for this mass protostar, let's say uh, we have a thousand solar masses worth of material, just to be conservative, um, that would suggest that the final stellar product might be as massive as 300 solar masses, which is kind of impossible when you think about how stars hold themselves together. So um, it, that probably would, that ratio probably would not hold in this case, but you know, that, that mass estimate depends on the gravitational signature that we saw. So it's not clear how concentrated towards the center that mass will wind up being. So, it, you know, it's part of the mystery. Cool, thank you. Do we have any online questions? Um, nope. Okay. I have more questions if uh, there aren't other questions in the room. <laughs> I also have a question uh, for Bruce, actually. Um, so you mentioned that these uh, outflows were repeating events in the past. They were like discrete. Is there any chance that your model of the perturber of the disk would cause it to repeat again sometime in the far future? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I wear hearing aids and I'm having a little bit of trouble. Right. Would you expect another outflow in the far future with your model of Do it again. Would you expect another outflow in the future? Oh, would I expect another outflow in the future? The behavior pattern of this star is that the, its ejections uh, are aperiodic, irregular. The first one, the oldest one, seems to be really energetic. Most of the kinetic energy in that outflow came from the first event. The final event, 900 years ago, was almost as energetic. The events in between were puffs compared to those two. Everything seems to have shut down 900 years ago. There's no evidence of any flows since then. Now, without a model to tell us how all this works, I can't answer the question. I, I would not predict another outflow, but that's just a guess. Thank you. Okay. If, if Gary has another question. I've lost my microphone. Or oh. have I? No, we're back. Okay. Um, my question is for Joan and Garrett. I love the idea of using archival observations to make new discoveries. And I'm curious if you have any plans, any particular archives that you're looking to investigate next. I'll take that one. <laughs> um, to start off with, we're using archive neutral hydrogen data from Bonn, and I'm about to get their full data cube for the higher resolution data, which I haven't got yet from the EBH1S data. And we have a lot of, a lot of papers planned because we are building on what we've just talked about today to expand the study to larger regions of sky. And uh, hopefully we will it'll keep us busy for a very long time. Great. I look Again. Great, I look forward to that. <laughs> we have another question in the room. My name is Butler Burton from Leiden. I have a question for Garrett Fischer and Joan Schmeltz too. There are dozens of high velocity cloud complexes and hundreds of high velocity clouds do you think your model will apply um, to this whole collection in one way or another? One interesting aspect of it is that it's not given much attention that not all high velocity clouds have uh, negative velocities. Many have positive velocities and your model would allow that. Can you comment on your expectations in this regard? 
Yes, hi, Butler. Um, we are focusing on the group of high-velocity clouds in the northern hemisphere in the first and second quadrants of the sky. As far as other parts of the sky is concerned, we're not looking at that at the moment. But we and, and we find that most of the so-called clouds are in fact parts of filaments. And uh, so, yeah, we think we can expand this study to include a lot of that stuff <laughs> in the northern sky. Um, we're not concerned with the southern sky or closer to the galactic plane. Joan, you want to add to that? Yeah, hi, Butler. I, I think um, that we started with the case that was most convincing, which was M1. And the fact that we could find um, not only a cavity in the hydrogen data, but a single line spectroscopic binary in the center of the cavity gave us compelling reasons to sort of convince each other that we might have something here. And then our next job was, was kind of to convince the, the, the high velocity cloud community. And as we expanded out from that to go from the cloud M1 to the complex M, um, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't sort of slowly continue to, to branch out, but I think we wanna make sure that each result is on sort of firm astronomical footing before we, we step further. So, so stay tuned. Uh, hi, this is uh, Peter Turbin, University of Maryland. I have a question for the other Peter. Um, when you talked about the mystery of that thousand solar masses that might form a 300 solar mass, is, the, is it, could it be that it breaks up that mass and create a double star? And are you still worried about the 150 or the even less efficiency and then it produces a star that's more reasonable? Many things are possible. <laughs> um, certainly, it, it turns out one of there is a, another bright infrared star uh, near MIR2. It, it does not seem to be a protostar, however, it seems to be a, a, a foreground star that just happens to be in the area. Um, and it turns out to be a double, a close double star. It's still massive. And so that certainly does happen. Uh, so MIR2 may indeed form a binary or a triple star system. Of course, it's all possible. But, you know, what would be really good is if we got more data, uh, high resolution armor or whatever, to pin down what's really going on in the central a uh, few hundred astronomical units or, you know, the central few solar system si sized area to try and figure out what the answer to your question is. Yep. Any last questions in the room? All right. So with that, I'd like to thank the PIOs who helped uh, prepare the press releases, our AV team. Uh, our next press conference will be this afternoon at 2.15. And let's thank our speakers one more time.